So welcome to, um, to New America NYC. Um, uh, this evening we are uh, hosting a discussion of uh, Rachel Aspen's book, uh, Generation Revolution. Um, we have uh, Rachel with us uh, tonight. It's your first. It's your first stop in the U on your U.S. tour. Is that correct? It is. I just arrived last night, so really happy so to be welcome. here. Welcome, welcome to New York. Um, we also have uh, with us. I, I'm sorry. I, I need to speak into the microphone. Um, also with us tonight, we have um, Angie uh, God, who's an um, Egyptian American. Um, writer who was actually um, on Tahrir for, for most of um, you know, the events um, uh, in the early part of the book. Um, um, Mustafa Bayoumi, um, a writer whom um, I'm sure many of you know, um, and a professor at uh, Brooklyn College. And uh, Sana Amanat. Um, did I? Her? That was okay. beautiful. Okay. Um, of, uh, an editor, you're an editor at Marvel. Is that uh, right? Director of content director development of at Marvel, yeah. I'm not sure what I'm doing here okay. because I make comics and these guys are actually doing real work, but I'm just hanging out. It's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to start, if we could, um, I'd like to ask Rachel to read a section from the early part of her book um, that I think really um, beautifully describes uh, the, the Egypt that she encountered um, when she first went in 2003. Um, so uh, Revolution Tahrir um, is, is many years away still, and, um, and you're observing um, uh, the role of, of the doorman, I, I get, uh, Boabs, in, 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 in your building and others. So. The fear of Aib. A word that means shame, but carries a far more toxic loading, ruled supreme. And the girl's reputation was her and her family's only protection against it. The restrictions varied according to class and where a family lived. But Aib could befall a girl at any time for a hundred reasons. From being seen with a strange man in public, to coming home too late, wearing something a little too eye-catching, or doing something reserved for men, like swearing or smoking or lingering on the street. What all these reasons had in common, as I found out when I first arrived in Cairo, was the watchful eyes that permanently surrounded you, waiting for a slip. God, for both Muslims and Christians, was the supreme witness. His angels and demons always on hand to record or to encourage your sins. But Aib didn't apply exclusively to believers. Egypt's handful of atheists suffered from its effects as much as anyone else, because the responsibility for moral surveillance flowed down from the supernatural realm in a pyramid to family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, passers-by, waiters, shopkeepers, and most of all, to the apartment building doorman, porters, guards, called Boabs, the eyes and ears of Cairo. Boabs were working class men, often brought as children by the building's richer owners from their own ancestral villages to the city. They lived with their families in dark basements or cramped rooms under the central stairs, supported by a small monthly fee from each apartment's owner or tenant topped up with tips for extra services and, often, bribes for the information only they were privy to. Bawab's first loyalty was to the building's owner, who they kept provided with gossip about tenants and neighbours. But the regime also made use of them as informants on foreigners, activists, gay men, prostitutes and anyone else of interest to the security services. Residents who felt themselves at risk could pay for a Baab silence, but always in the knowledge that a threat or a larger bribe might reverse it. Women were especially vulnerable because a Baab could and would inform not only his fellow Baabs, but also parents, neighbors, and landlords about any minor infraction, leaving a girl's reputation and therefore her family's in tatters. 
It's all to protect girls because they're more precious than men. Everyone shrugged when Nayera complained about the double standards that curbed her freedom. People joked about the, symbi about the symbiotic relationships with their Baobabs. But to me, the web of observation and judgment that stretched between Baobabs, owners, tenants and neighbours seemed a sinister informal extension of the state's sprawling surveillance machine. Egypt's security services had been consolidated in the 1950s by Gamal Abdel Nasser with the help of a motley international assortment of spies and torturers, including fugitive Nazis he installed in luxury villas and kept working for low pay with the threat of extradition to Israel. Under Mubarak, the security services were estimated to employ two million people, dwarfing the armed forces. The largest service, the Interior Ministry's Amna Daula, State Security, monitored not only citizens' political tendencies, but their sex lives for any hint of deviation from the state-sanctioned norm that might leave them open to blackmail or prosecution. Thank you. Um. No, I, I love that because I, you know, I, I think when you when we you look uh, from afar at an authoritarian regime, it's easy to imagine this sort of terrifying, you know, security apparatus. And and but you, you show you, you show really beautifully how sort of mundane and how it, it, it's uh, these these eyes and ears and are are part of your everyday life, people you're closest to. Absolutely, it seeps into the fabric of your life day to day, and this was something that, that, that struck me so heavily when I went there first from the UK. There is no moment when you're not being observed, and you may think it's something that is innocuous, it may just be your neighbour kind of peeking through the curtains, but that piece of information can and often will be passed on in a chain, and it will end up in the hands of the security services. Angie, is that something that you... Um I know you, you moved to, um, you were born in the States and, and moved back to Egypt as a, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about what that adjustment was like? Whether, did, did you feel that, that you had to adjust to a different level of observation? And yeah, I was actually, sorry, I was just talking to Rachel um, before we came up and I was telling her how um, being born and raised here, uh, everyone is kind of outspoken. Everyone can kind of speak their mind and uh, not really, really really have to worry about anything. And I moved there when I was 15, um, and uh, I was just telling her when I started school and I uh, was just kind of speaking about the government. They're like, no, 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 we don't do that here. Um, we know you're an American, but don't talk about that stuff. So it was kind of an adjustment. Um, you know, not that I had strong uh, feelings about Mubarak at 15, having just moved to Egypt. I didn't really understand anything yet. Um, but slowly... Um, but they wouldn't even entertain it as a subject. No, they just shut down. N no, and we, I mean, these, I, would, I went to school with um, very uh, privileged and entitled um, individuals coming from very rich families that were... Um, mm -hmm. uh, were actually Mubarak seeing in power was actually in their best interest, and even that was kind of like hushed. My my father strictly gave me orders when um, before we moved to like do not talk about politics, do not talk about anything. This is completely different, and I thought it was just a scare tactic to have so that my I wouldn't get in any trouble. But he was like, I'm serious, do not talk about anything. And um, and then post revolution, we just had this huge kind of this big vacuum where oh my god, we can actually talk about things now. Um, so um, it was just been this back and forth. Um, uh, post-revolution, then SCAF, then military, yeah. then Morsi, then CC. So it's just been back and forth. Whiplash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, what it was like watching the revolution as a, as a student. And how old were you? What year of college? When did you first go to the square? I was um, in my third year of undergrad as a political science major in Cairo. So this was perfect. Um, and I was, um, 2011, I was 21. I was 20 turning 21 and um, I was actually in Spain the day the second day that after the first day of protests ended mm -hmm. and I remember I got a Facebook invite or something to the to the event, right? And I was like, oh, this is not gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen. We saw what happened in Tunisia and um, I saw and I kind of entertained it with my mom. She's like, absolutely not. You're gonna get arrested. You're not going. Um, so I kind of went through with my parents to go to Spain and uh, when we got there my friends and I was a 
small college trip. Um, it didn't last long. Uh, we had to cut it short. We lost all communication with our family. Um, internet was cut off there, so I, we had to kind of go back to landlines, and um, even that was kind of difficult to do while I was overseas. So we ended up going back to Egypt, and it, it's funny, as we were going back, there were people camped out in tents in um, Cairo airport trying to get out of the country, and we're trying to get back in. Um, I forget the specific day that uh, was my first day, like which day in the 18 days that it was, but I kind of had to uh, sneak around and, and get there because it was strictly forbidden. Did, did you go back to classes or did you just Everything go was closed. The, okay. So right. schools were closed, banks were closed, everything. And this is mm -hmm. the, the period where everyone was like restless. We want to get back to work. We want to get back. So people were kind of impatient. But no, we didn't have, clo uh, we didn't have um, schools were closed and there was a curfew. So I'd have to go between a certain time where I was telling my family that I was out at the cafe with my friends uh, watching soccer, <laughs> but we weren't. Um, and um, so we kind of go, but we'd go during safe periods of, of the day where there wasn't any kind of threat mm -hmm. or anything to uh, young women or anything. Because okay. later on at night, it kind of got a little, um, things got a little um, risky. And then my last day there was um, the day before Mubarak uh, stepped down. And uh, I was really sad I wasn't there the day of, but I was still celebrating as all of Egypt was at the time. So it was very and fun. And you managed to get your parents finally to come, yes. right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The last day. Um, you had this wonderful phrase, like. Hezbul uh, Kanava. Hezbul yes. yeah. Kanava in Arabic translates to the party of the couch. So this is a, a very big term that um, was... It's, it's, it's those who supported the revolution from the safety of their sofas. Yeah. Who, um, Literally. <laughs> um, so they got to right. sit at home. It's kind of like when you're um, watching the Olympics, sitting there eating your chips, right? And you're, you're commenting, making fun of people. But except most Egyptians were sitting on their couch uh, making, or, you know, commenting about the regime, but they were not actually out there protesting. Uh, so I finally got my parents to come. And um, my mom was so frightened, and I had a hoodie on, and she just kept grabbing me. She's like, don't go. Someone's going to kidnap you. So um, no one kidnapped me. It was fine. So um, it, was, it was exciting, and there was... Egyptians kind of tend to make everything fun. Um, so there was tea, um, there were vendors selling sweet potato. Staff uh, is nodding. Yeah, <laughs> right? They, they make a profit of everything and they also make everything kind of very fun atmosphere. So Abdul Halim, a very famous Egyptian singer, was blasting in the speakers in the square. And my parents were like, oh, this is actually not that bad. Um, and they had a great time. And then uh, about like an hour and a half into it, my dad gets a call get out of there, like the Americans are coming. I was like, what are you talking about? So we ended up kind of leaving and it was like, this, yeah, it was rumors, there was rumors spreading every day. Everyone was worried that there would be another, um, the security service or something would kind mm -hmm. of come in like the, the, the battle of the camel, that yeah. the second or third day, I forget. So um, we ended up leaving, but it, they had a great time and they loved it, so it was a success. Yeah. And so you were, um, you were back in, in England, is that correct? Uh, during the days of the January and February of 2011? During the 18 but days. plotting to get back? Yeah, okay. exactly. I, w I, was, um, I worked for the Guardian newspapers, so I was sitting in the office watching all of this happen on the news as everyone else was. It must have been killing you. <laughs> it was. Yeah. And at the same time, I was getting these messages mm. when they could, because during the revolution, um, the, the internet was shut down, and they shut down mobile phone mm. services. So it was, you know, very literal-minded way of trying to stop people from communicating with each other that shows you how the regime thinks, really. But when they could, I was getting these messages from people saying, we're in the square, you know, you have to tell our story. And um, that was really, um, that really crystallized in my mind the work that I'd already been doing in Egypt prior to the revolution. And I thought, yeah, you know, what these young people are doing is, is extraordinary, and I would like to go back. and document how they're trying to bring this change about. And at that time, you know, the, these were these kind of euphoric days that everyone talks about, these magical 18 days when everything seemed possible. We didn't know what was going to happen in the future. And really, this book tells the story of, of, of you know, kind of the, the arc of that hope gradually being uh, crushed. But, you know, th those moments were magical. And um, as Angie's saying, you know, if you experience them, you, you can never forget them. Um, you know, we, we, we've, I think analysts talk a lot about, you know, so did the Arab Spring fail? Did Egypt's Arab Spring fail? Uh, I guess I, 
I, I'm, I'm, I know Angie takes the position that it's incomplete, yeah. which I find a very interesting way of, of, of putting it. And I wonder if you could describe, um, and I'd love to hear what you, what you think. Um, so, I'm, I've kind of been in denial the past six years every time someone, um, so the anniversary was just last month and um, remember uh, I, I was out with friends and I brought my Egyptian flag and I was waving it and I was like, guys, it's the anniversary, it's six years. And they're like, what are you celebrating? <laughs> Nothing's happened. It's, it, and I was like, well, just let me live. Like it's, it, the memory of it is what's celebratory to me. But um, it is incomplete and I've, I've realized that I've been in denial thinking that uh, it, it has, we haven't completed it, but it will be completed at some point. But mm -hmm. slowly, like Rachel was just saying, just holding on to those euphoric 18 days, it's kind of hard to let go because it was so unorthodox and something that we never expected. Um, but I mean, after the 18 days were over, and I've talked about this in my piece, that um, we expected everything. So February 11th, he stepped down. We expected things to start uh, working in our favor February 12th. and that did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, we expected every, I mean, I remember right after everyone went out and started cleaning the streets and painting the sidewalk, something nobody ever did before. And it was, it was, it was amazing bonding experience that Egyptians have never done this before. People were very um, optimistic and positive saying, there's no more corruption. And it, it, it only took, it didn't take long for it to sink in that the deep state is, is deep and it's going to get deeper. And um, so now I, 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 I fear that the regime is just making sure that this never happens again, and I think it's just clamping down harder and harder. Um, and I think that's an understatement of the century with yeah. uh, the current regime. So, uh, Mustafa, you, you've been nod nodding a lot. I, I'd love to. I have to, a tendency to there, nod. <laughs> no, but there were no, but there were so many. Um, I mean, so many interesting things in, in what you what you said. Um, I guess I, I'm wondering um, if you might be able to talk a bit about the deep state that Angie mentioned and and. Um, I, it's a phrase we're hearing a lot now um, in reference <laughs> to our own <laughs> government, which is interesting, but, but could you maybe yeah, sure. describe um, what happened in Egypt? Uh, I think I would say, you know, one, there are ways, of course, where Egypt is very different than uh, the United States, and then there are ways in which sometimes the two seem to approximate each other <laughs> in troubling ways. Um, like, I'll give you an example, because, you know, I think that the way this began with this idea that in the uh, United States we have like complete freedom of expression, freedom of mm -hmm. thought, and in Egypt it was completely shut down. Well, tomorrow, actually, I'm going to be on a panel at Brooklyn College, where I teach. We're having a panel about freedom of expression and the First Amendment on campuses. Um, and I'm talking about testimony that was uh, given by two Muslim students last year about the fact that there was an NYPD undercover officer on that campus for s at least four years. You know, and the, and the New York Police Department has been following the activities and daily lives of Muslim Americans uh, um, for years in this country. And I know a lot of Muslim Americans here in the United States who feel like they don't actually have that freedom to say what they want to say in public and are very concerned about the <laughs> listening apparatus of the state. And the, the, uh, the uh, Associated Press won a Pulitzer Prize precisely for this series when they broke the, uh, the story from the, the, uh, um, the degree to which the NYPD was in fact just spying on the very quotidian, daily, meaningless you know, uh, elements of life, from going to a, a cafe to getting your hair cut to whatever, buying an airplane ticket. Um, so in that way, maybe there's not, you know, maybe the similarities are not exactly as stark as we want to think. And so I think it's really important to think about the ways uh, in some complexity about these two locations. But that as it may, you know, I think um, um, we do have a lot of talk about the deep state in the United States right now. And um, uh, uh, according to some, they're supposed uh, to save us, right? It's these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Uh, in Egypt, I think one way of thinking about the situation in Egypt, um, with some complexity, it seems to me, is that there was a revolution, there was an uprising, a popular uprising in 2011, that certainly led to a change of government, um, and uh, now uh, whether that change of government, though was 
complete is mm -hmm. a real question because in a lot of ways you actually had a kind of inter-elite competition happening in mm -hmm. Egypt at that time. You had essentially the old style military which controls vast amounts of the economy in Egypt um, directly uh, and the people who are commissioned officers get, get uh, mm -hmm. uh, commissioned out of the military and get vast tracts of the economic uh, uh, plentitudes in the country. Uh, you have growing, massive levels of growing inequality in Egypt. Uh, and then, but you also do have a kind of like upwardly mobile bourgeoisie class that's actually separate from the military. And so when you have the, the and, and what's interesting about Mubarak is that Hosni Mubarak was himself a military man, but he was from the Air Force, which is not traditionally the, the, where the rulers in Egypt have come from either. So in some ways he was outside of the traditional elite on that level. But more importantly too, is that he was grooming his sons to, over, to take over afterwards. And his sons do not come from the military, they come from that other sort of bourgeois class. Mm -hmm. So I think that in a lot of ways you had a popular uprising against massive amounts of inequality, massive amounts of uh, um, police brutality, you had the Khaled Said uh, case before. You had, um, you had the church bombing not months earlier, so there was also sectarian violence that was actually in some ways galvanizing the population against the state. Uh, you had a lot, a whole lot of labor agitation if you look at the April 6th movement and others, and so that's often underplayed, the labor element to the Egyptian uprising. Um, so you had the, all of the groundwork for a real social, you know, uh, change. And then it seemed in some ways that, if, you know, that what happened was just the inter-elites, within the elites, they just changed places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, I think, is a good example of how the deep state actually will maintain itself um, while the rest of the country thinks that they're actually gaining something from this. And then, it, uh, you know, to many, I think, to many observers of Egypt, there was a sense that as soon as that happened in February, 2001, there was a plan that they're going to make sure that they stay in charge forever and as long as they can. However, the economy has, of course, ground to a complete halt in Egypt to the point where now they've had to float the pound, the pound which have traditionally been tied to the American dollar. And so now the, the pound is about 20? 15 and some, More and 18, 15, well, 18, 18 on the black yeah, market. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it went from 8 to 18 or yeah. so, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overnight. So people have basically lost half of their income and half of their, 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 um, their family worth at the same time, too. Um, so, you know, my way of, uh, this is, I'm giving you too long an answer, but no, I'll no, just no, end with this. But my, my way of thinking about the, um, the revolution, too, is that the early phase of the uprising of the revolution was essentially, it seems to me, a political uprising. It was many different mm -hmm. parts of the civil, Egyptian civil society mm -hmm. saying, we want to be able to have a voice in our affairs, we want to be able to have a change in our society, we want to be able to articulate that change. And, you know, the, the deep state tried to manage that in all kinds of mm -hmm. ways and not let it come to fruition. But now the levels of economic inequalities and levels mm -hmm. of deprivations and eventually the levels of political and, and uh, um, you know, uh, just shutting down of every element of civil society in the country, I think will ultimately lead to another kind of uprising. For all of the violence that has been there in Egypt from 2011 till today, it doesn't compare to a lot of violence that happens in, rest of the, in the rest of the region. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that it'll... You know, I do think, I, I completely agree that, the, that what's happening in Egypt is incomplete. Um, but my fear is that the next phase is actually going to be much more violent than we've, what we've seen already. Did, did you want to? I just was curious to know what your, what your thoughts on, on like the appetite of Egyptians now for another uh, wave of, uh, another wave of uprisings. I just feel like you talk to a lot of people um, now, just, just last year I was just talking to random people in the streets and they're like, we don't want we don't want this anymore. We just um, everything is stable. We don't want to be like Syria. We don't want to be like Iraq. We you know everyone's kind of going to hell. Sorry, but um, and we're the only ones that are s safe and stable. And um, they just want to maintain that. They don't want to go back to that 2011 to 2015 or 2014 period of uncertainty and stability. Um, and they're like, well, the economy is worse now than when it than before the uprisings, and you see a sense of hesitancy among people, and whether that uprise, whether it's gonna take, I don't know how long it would take for, the, for this to resurface again, but I'm not sure what your thoughts are on their appetite right now. Well, I mean, I think, and I'd love to hear what Rachel thinks about this too, but I, it, I think you're absolutely right. I think people in Egypt are exhausted 
uh, I mean, how long has this been going on and they haven't seen anything that's worth, uh, that, that's coming to fruition out of it? And how many times do they have to vote? I mean, their voting is, and for it to be meaningless at the same time, in a sense, too. Like, they got, they got kind of sick of voting. I mean, I remember, I, I can't remember at which point it was that I was tell, talking to my Egyptian friends and I was like, Egyptians are really good at ousting governments. <laughs> Keeping them in, not so much, <laughs> you know? Um, and it is, it is completely um, uh, it, it overwhelming. I mean, I think we see just a little tiny, 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 tiny bit of it, you know, from the election of Mr. Trump. Because it's not, I mean, I mean, I've gone to many protests and I'm like out on the streets and I'm trying to do things about that too. And I'm already tired. I mean, I have a day job too, you know? And so imagine what it's like if you're actually in a place where it's like, like Egypt. Well, you no, just, hey. you just you, you described um, this in your, in your uh, essay, talking about it. people were complaining about how the revolution lasted too long, even in the yeah, first eight, week. 18 days, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, oh, I just want to go back to my job. I want to get paid. I want to, I want to be able to go to the cafe and, and eat at the bougie restaurants on the Nile. Um, but nobody could do that because there was a curfew and there was barricades. Nobody could. But the, I mean, the most important thing to understand about that is that that's exactly also how authoritarian regimes Work. want it to be they yeah. want it to be that way mm -hmm. they want politics to be so expensive so dangerous so exhausting especially yeah. and that they demobilize the public away from they just uh, from any kind of uprisings any kind of politics any mm -hmm. kind of assembly so that you just keep your back to the wall yeah. and you walk a straight line and you know that's that's exactly i mean Mr. Trump is trying to keep us exhausted for a reason, yeah. too. No, I love the, the way you use the word exhausting. I mean, I think that's exactly right. It's not fear. It's not. It's just sheer, yeah, exhaustion. I, I feel like every, I mean, not to interrupt, but I feel like every single time he tweets, I get more angry. I don't get, I mean, I'm exhausted, but then I'm like, what do I do next? Where's the next protest and or rally? And how do I keep activated? And I think the problem is like having a lot of protests and rallies is sort of the organization, continued organization, and sort of the next steps. How do we continue to be organized and aligned in our efforts outside of just going to rallies? What's next? I mean, I think that's what the Women's March was pretty interesting because you were able to go to these events and then they had follow up and follow up and follow up. And I think that's the larger question is when you have this entire you know, nation that is activated, um, how do you continue to keep them engaged and excited and angry a little bit um, and, and not exhausted all the time? It, it's funny you mention that because, um, so I, I can't remember for how long, but after the revolution, every Friday, it was Friday of rage, Friday of anger, Friday of something. Um, every Friday, people were going out. It was like, oh, we haven't protested for 60 years. Or we're going to get it all out now. Um, so everyone was protesting all the time. And I mean, that went on for a couple of years until CC kind of banned it. And then um, I would kind of say now, as you were saying that, and Mustafa, as you were speaking, um, since the economy is so much worse now than it was before, um, I think people are kind of on the, well, if we protest again and we do this again, how much worse is it going to be and how much risk am I willing to take? Um, I think what I'd say about that is that, um, you know, if, we, if we're talking about Egypt, what happened with the, the generation of the parents that the people I'm talking about in, in 2011, they had this implicit understanding with the state that as long as they stayed out of politics, they would have a certain standard of living. They would, there would be enough jobs. They would be able to get food for their families. You just had to keep your back to the wall. Stay out of politics. Don't cross the red lines. Everyone knew what they were. And what happened before the revolution was that that started to break down. People realized that it didn't matter whether they stayed out of politics or not. They weren't going to get these things that they had been promised. And what, um, you know, as, as Mustafa's very, very rightly saying, Egypt is facing this, um, you know, these structural limiting factors that no one can do anything about. The population explosion, I think by 2035, the population is going to be 140 million. There's no way to feed these people. There's no way to have enough water for them. There's no way to give them jobs. Um, so regardless of what political measures are in place, people are going to be driven to this point of desperation where they have to act. And I think what we're seeing now in, in, in the US and in the, in the UK as well, is that though the um, economic conditions are different, 
people do feel that they've reached this point where politics is impinging on their lives whether they want it to or not. There are going to be consequences for them and they can't afford to be passive any longer and they have to take action. But I, I mean, I guess for, for me, I feel like I completely agree. I think that's totally the case. I feel like people have this desire, um, like they have no choice but to become activated and to be a bit more politicized. But then on the other end of it, it's sort of, you know, this fear and whoever voted for Trump, that's totally cool, but it is sort of that fear of like, oh, to, who, who out there, who that I'm coming upon um, voted for Trump? And there's this sort of, you know, being a brown person and being a Muslim in this country, um, there's that constant fear that you are not as, as vocal as I'd like to be, um, there's that fear that you might, you have to be a little bit more cautious. You have to be, um, because we're so polarized right now, um, and the struggle that I'm having, especially, you know, being the position that I have at Marvel and being a little bit more vocal, is to make sure that I don't also, pardon my French, piss off half of my consumer base who might have a very different ideology than what I'm putting out there. Um, so it is this sort of constant um, walking of the line of feeling like you want to be active and engaged, but then at the same time understand that maybe we, you know, I, I feel sometimes I have to be a bit more silent. So there's this thing hanging over me um, that makes me second guess the things that I'm saying because of the fact that we're, we are so deeply divided now than we ever have been before. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to, you know, potentially deal with that. Um, this is my therapy for, for you guys. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't um, mean to change the subject. I think it's going to look like that for a second. But I wondered if we could talk for a minute about, about institutions, like, you know, institution building. Uh, it's a very sort of boring political science-y topic. But I think it's really necessary because, you know, I... Um, and I include myself in this. Journalists love talking about revolutions and activists and people who are outspoken and who who uh, call for change. But then, and and that's important. We need to to get people who are willing to call for change. But then, you need the institutions that are going to sustain that. You need these these sort of uh, very mundane, the post office, the um, rev internal revenue service. You know the and when these are. Um, are not uh, kind of constructed in a way that will support democracy. You're you're sort of lost, and and I this is a really big question. I don't know the answer to it, but I, I would just love to sort of throw it open to uh, the panel. And if you could talk about your observations um, around, because I, I mean, the, I thought about this because you were talking about the cleaning of the streets, mm -hmm. which is such a kind of a lovely moment. I mean, that is that is a moment that gives us a lot of hope. It suggests that people are, um, are valuing the public space mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a sort of a community in a way that I have not personally observed, honestly. You know, um, reporting in the Arab, Arab world all, all that very much. You know, um, I, yeah, I just love to sort of hear what, hear what you have to say, because I, I, I was, um, you know, because the idea that the Arab Spring failed could could possibly be dangerous, right? I mean, we're we're in a we're in an era where um, um, these um, sort of misinformation about refugees and and um, um, about um, the state of the Middle East is is being used to um, well. We, we, uh, I, I don't want to to kind of get sidetracked with the, too much, but, but there, but 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 I, I think there. Do, do you agree that there's a sort of a danger with in, in seeing this as a failure or accepting the idea that it could be a failure? Um. Yeah, I think so. I mean, just you. We've covered quite a lot of ground. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, just to take it back to the institutions for yeah. a moment, just to illustrate what it's like somewhere like Egypt. I speak in the book about uh, someone I knew who was working in the Ministry of Justice. Very, you know, very vital, central, central role. And he turns up at work one day and the building is locked. And he says, well, you know, what's, what's going on? I need to get inside and, and do some work. And they say, oh no, you can't go in because there are snakes 
And he's like, what do you mean, snakes? And they, and they said, well, the, the basement's full of snakes. So he said, well, what are we going to do about it? And they said, well, don't worry, just calm down. We're going to bring in the Riffae. And the Riffae are this mystical Sufi order of religious men who specialize in taming snakes, scorpions, and other dangerous creatures by reciting verses from the Quran. Thank goodness. <laughs> So, you know, eventually the Rifai were brought in, the basement, you know, some Quran was read in the basement, the snakes, if they ever were there, were dispatched. And, you know, everyone had lost 10 days of work. So this is a kind of, like, r ridiculous. I, I feel like Egypt always swings between tragedy and farce, and this is one of the farcical elements, but this is a kind of ridiculous illustration of how hollowed out the institutions are, how incapable they are of, of, of doing any serious work. And, um, you know, just, just moving on to what you were saying about the failure of the Arab Spring, I think there was a lot of criticism directed at the liberal revolutionaries of Tahrir um, after things started to go wrong. And people were saying, you know, you, sh you should have organized, you should have reached out to the rest of the population who don't share your values, you should have educated people, you should have lifted them up. And I think that was completely unfair because they were stuck in this situation where the institutions were so rotten, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the limiting factors were so severe that no matter what they did, they couldn't have done that. However, what they did achieve, and what I think is so vital, is that they gave people these experiences that, that they'd never had before, the experience of participating in, in a protest with tens, hundreds of thousands of people, of seeing a president step down because of your actions, of taking part in free elections, which is something that no Egyptians had ever experienced before. And these moments, I think, have just sown the seeds. People know that this is possible. And so when circumstances change, as we hope they will in the future, I'm sure they will bear fruit. Um, you know, it's so easy to judge from the outside. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to do it for a second. Anyway. <laughs> Which is that, you know, I, I thought at the time of the revolution, too, that really what, Egypt, what would have benefited Egypt the most would have been a, ter a caretaker government in the beginning, and then the writing of the constitution, mm -hmm. and then to have the real, you know, sort of elections mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the, the sort of democracy mm -hmm. flourish from there. And instead, it, the, the, they put the government in first, and then the writing of the constitution came after, and then that became a huge battle inside of Egypt, and then Morsi claimed himself to be above the law, and, the, and the, you know, it was all part of the problematics of it all. Um, and so, I, you know, and that also just illustrates the, the, you know, the degree to which uh, there's a lack of institutional framework and the different elements of the society were really at each other's throats or, you know, there was no parliament forever in Egypt as well. Um, it basically isn't. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, there was, the judiciary was then af against the, uh, the executive branch and, like, you know, so there's really, no, there's, there's such a, um, an atrophied, um, a political culture in Egypt that has, of course, that has gone since the, I mean, even before 52, I mean, it was, uh, it was it's this huge bureaucracy that everybody uh, is a part of in Egypt is a remnant also of British colonial rule inside of Egypt too. And so, you know, we, there has to be a much more um, uh, sort of wide ranging solution that's really otherwise Egypt is doomed. But at the same time too, I mean, what we did see, and what we have seen at certain moments is, you know, an incredible amount of innovation and, mm -hmm. and people wa wanting to work together and making different kinds of realities possible. Uh, and I mean, you know, at the ground, on the ground level, like even, you know, during the days, I was there actually in late, uh, when one of some of the Morsi uprisings went up, uh, sort of late 2012, early 2013. And um, even then you saw some of the uh, immediate um, um, medical clinics sort of pop up, uh, 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 pop up again in Tahrir and like, and they were housed, they were often in churches, but the doctors were both Muslims and Christians, and there was like a real sense of unity trying to work towards this, and you know, so there was, there's a lot of that was happening. Um, and then on the other hand, 
you know, you say you need an IRS. Well, Egypt hasn't had, nobody collects taxes <laughs> in Egypt. Oh, yeah. To the point where but one of Morsi's, I mean, one, one good idea <laughs> if you hope to pay your traffic cops enough that they don't have to extract bribes every time they make it, you know. My cousin but, was yeah. visiting me a few years, like, I don't know, maybe teaching. four years ago. Mm. And, um, and so we decided, you know, we're walking around um, uh, midtown Manhattan. And he's like, let's go to Central Park. So I'm like, okay, so we, could, we get to Central Park. And he's, he wants to rent bikes. And he's just looking at Central Park and he's like, this is so beautiful. He's like, I would pay taxes if we could have this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but nobody pays tax. I mean, Sisi's uh, solution to Egypt's economic problems was that people should just give the oh. change in their pockets <laughs> to the government. The solution was text me an Egyptian pound. If one, pr if one Egyptian texted me an Egyptian pound, we'd have 10 million dollar, or 10 million Egyptian pounds. That was his solution to the economic issue. It was a joke, but. I also want to give a special shout out to cultural institutions and the importance um, of making sure we do not overlook them because, you know, like, you know, we, we obviously, financial institutions, um, government facilities, like post offices, those, I mean, those are the things that make us, make life happen. Mm -hmm. And I think these kind of cultural institutions and the arts make life worth living. Um, and it's a, it's a reminder of the ideals that um, these revolutions and these um, this sort of this cries for for change, um, what they're built upon and what we're actually fighting for. You know the um, you know whether it's sort of the history of a particular country or sort of the larger ideals um, and the stories that we tell ourselves um, and the meaning and the messages behind them. How incredibly important it is that we invest in them and that we sort of continue to build them and grow them because I do believe that social change and actual change begins th by injecting that conscientiousness through through our culture um through actual cultural change and you know for me i'm always going to say that starts with storytelling and the images that we put out there um fundamentally because that's that's education in a very small and subtle way but it's also economic right because because i i think sometimes the um the the you know, the idea that we'll educate away corruption or that it's a, a matter of just having seminars for government officials. You know, I, I'm constantly a friends who work at NGOs. They're constantly having, you know, seminars. And, um, but, but, you know, I, I, I remember the first year I lived in Damascus, my mother sent me a care package at one point and I went down to the central post office to pick it up and it took me, um, I had to pay, before I could pick it up, it took me two hours waiting in lines and bribes to three separate officials. And, and, you know, just the, the word exhaustion comes to mind. It's just like the most mundane tasks um, of daily life yeah. require. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> I, what, what were you saying? Uh, Rachel must know a lot about that. Oh, well, I'm sure we yeah. had that Yeah, no, no it's yeah. everybody who's, you know, has had a million experience. But, but, but it's just, I, I, I think um, there's a point where corruption and, and I can't really speak about Egypt. I, I don't know Egypt well, well, the Egyptian example on it. But in Syria, for example, it's just, they're, they're at a, they're, they're, there's a, a point where it's not even seen as bad behavior anymore. It doesn't even really register. It's just supporting your family. It's doing what you have to do. And how do you get past that? It's, it's not, you know, I feel like we're beyond the reach a little bit of, of cultural institutions and just education here. I, I, I'd just like to go um, back actually to what Sana was saying about storytelling because I, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying, what you're talking about is how things become normalized and I think if, um, you know, if, if progressive people don't take control of the narrative, the state will step into that vacuum <laughs> Absolutely. and that is something that, that definitely happened in Egypt. And a lot of what I found so confusing and baffling about my time there was trying to work out where people's beliefs had come from. And in a lot of instances, they were from stories that they'd been told by the state. Mm. So for instance, uh, in northern Cairo, there is this looming, insane, crazy panorama that commemorates the 1973 oh, yeah. war. And this was a gift from the North Korean regime to Hosni Mubarak. Mm -hmm. And you go inside this panorama and it tells you the story of the heroic, manly, you know, kind of triumphant Egyptians overcoming these cowardly, effeminate, cringing Israelis. 
and how the whole war was this completely fabulous triumph that, you know, just shows how great Egyptians are, how rubbish Israelis are. The fact that the war actually ended with Israeli forces poised 100 kilometers mm -hmm. from Cairo is neither here nor there. But, you know, people believe this myth that they've been told. And in the absence of more positive stories, mm -hmm. I think that, that is where it becomes really, really dangerous. Mm -hmm. but, but if your salary is, is so low that you actually can't pay your bills or support your family with your, you know, what, what I mean, there are an enormous number, I don't know the number of uh, Egyptians that are employed by the state, but it's, it's, it's quite a lot, isn't it? You know, and, and right, and so, so if your teachers, policemen, and, and you're telling these people, we, we can't write them off as being sort of uh, kind of bad state functionaries, really, right? It, it, I mean, we are, we're not, the state that we are, you know, kind of arguing against is, is everyone, essentially, right? It's, it's everyone's uncle, it's everybody's dad, or um, maybe I'm not making sense. Okay. I, no, I, I just think, I, I mean, I, I'm just asking the question. I mean, is, is, there, a, is there a point, be, is there something beyond narratives? Um. I don't know. I think that's a very good point. And, and I think one, another related thing that's worth mentioning in terms of um, the military in particular and the support for the military coup is that Egypt still has um, compulsory military service. Mm -hmm. So all male Egyptians have had the experience of being part of the armed forces. And it is this real rite of passage for people where no one wants to do it, and people will go to quite extreme lengths I to try and get out story. of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you met someone who uh, had, 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 had ga deliberately gained 88 pounds mm -hmm. to, to get out of military service? Yeah, and <laughs> just <laughs> That was one of the, the, people the chopping less off extreme fingers. measures. Yeah, yeah people, if you, if you um, cut kilos. off your, your trigger finger yeah. or one of your big toes, you will also be exempt from service. So it just depends what lengths you're prepared to go to. But um, yeah, th this, this particular way in which people had felt absorbed um, into the military, they had, mm -hmm. they had identified with the army. Um, you know, they, they thought that the army is us, we are the army. And in a lot yes. of ways that the army is the state as well. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that, that explains a lot of the yeah, support. That's what I'm trying to yeah, get at. Exactly. You know, it, it's not yeah. a matter of just sort of, okay, this telling people the state is telling you this, but if, if you are the state, if everyone is the... Absolutely. All right. Um, I think we're going to open it up to, to questions from the audience. Um, anybody have... Yes. Uh, sir? Uh, well, interesting conversation. Oh, sorry, can I borrow your hand? Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I, just, I wonder to what degree, I mean, we've had this whole phenomenon of Trump, then Brexit, and I don't know about Egypt, but the whole question of, of bubbles has come up, and we all have our assumptions about what, where Egypt should go, progressive uh, revolution and so on, but there are many people in Egypt who we're just getting into the fact that other people support the state, they support the military, um, they're Islamists, right? The Muslim Brotherhood is a huge force, and I, I don't know how much they would share the, the various um, values uh, that, that almost all of us, I think, here would share. So, I mean, is this a concern? How, all of us are part of the bourgeoisie, you know. How do you get outside of it as a journalist? And is, our converse, is your conversation here taking into account that part of the population? Um. Would you like to? Sure. I mean, I, I think this, this is one of the major themes of the book, actually, is my, my, um, my struggles with the realization that, that a lot of the people I meet hold views that are completely different to my own, um, whether those are religiously informed, whether they're politically informed, whether they're socially informed. Um, and I have quite a lot of surprising moments in the book where I realize that... Um, you know, you can have common cause with people whose views you find quite unsavory. So, for instance, we were talking earlier about the, um, you know, how broad-based the movement against Mubarak was, how that really brought people together. And, um, you know, in Tahrir Square, 
progressive liberal people found themselves standing next to, you know, conservative Islamists, found themselves standing next to leftists, found themselves standing next to all sorts of people who had never normally, um, you know, come together. And the, the fragmentation that happened after that um, was very sad, I think. And I think that we, you're quite right, like we do necessarily find ourselves in our own bubbles, but also, as I was mentioning earlier, I think that blaming liberals for that is completely unfair. To uh, draw an, another uh, uh, historical analogy, uh, a lot of people said that the Arab Spring series of revolutions uh, seem most, uh, most similar to the revolutions of 1848 uh, in Europe, the springtime for peoples, uh, and uh, which was widespread. And uh, it, it was widely viewed in the years after those revolutions that although they changed a few things in a few places, they mostly failed. Uh, people were very disappointed in what happened uh, in those revolutions. But then if you look in the decades and the generations thereafter, and the changes that happened in Europe, the various unifications and the wars and revolutions, people sort of see that as a process, a generational process, that, that 1848 really was a part of a, a lot larger process. Uh, do you think uh, in the generations to come, in the 10 and the 20 years, uh, we will start having events where people will say uh, uh, the Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution really was part of that process? Uh, how do you think that will develop? I want to say no, because um, as you were speaking and kind of trying to draw parallels, I'm thinking of Egypt back in 1952 and uh, the Middle East back in the 50s and the 60s and the wave of revolution, revolutions that took place there and the coups that happened and the change in leadership in those countries. Um, I'm not too familiar with the wave in eight, was it 1848, you said. Um, uh, I, I just see... A, waves of new authoritarian dictators coming into power more so than um, this being part of a larger uh, pattern of um, kind of moving towards more freedoms for these countries. I, I mean, reasonable people may and will disagree, but I, I, I just, for now, I don't see that um, in the short term kind of being the bigger picture later on. Well, I, th I think that... Uh Predicting the future is always treacherous, for one thing. So, who knows what's really going to happen? Um, I mean, I thought Hillary had it. So, uh, but um, um, the other side of that is that there's a there's a difference, though. I think between 1848 and you know the contemporary Middle East, which is geopolitics, like in the international variety. I mean, like if you take Syria for example, you have 12 different countries that have their tentacles in Syria right now. Uh, what happens in the Middle East, in the Arab world right now, is so consequential, not just to the people who live there. And so that means that other people are going to involve themselves in the affairs of what's happening there too, uh, whether we like it or not, and whether we know about it, how much we know about it or not too. And I think that that's just going to make things incredibly complicated. Um, and so we need more, you know, we need more people digging in, into those stories and finding out really what's happening. Uh, but in the long term, I mean, I just don't think that, you know, I mean, I think that there was something, I think people are tired now, but I think that there was something that was removed from the Arab region. Uh, and that was a sense of like, you know, um, atrophy and like, and fear. And there was this opportunity that they see. And I don't think that that's so easily disposed of. I just don't. So. In your different writings, it seems to me that you've each written about different people or segments of the population that have wanted change, that maybe they've been outsiders. What I'm wondering is, in talking to people and given what's occurred, is there hope? And if there is hope, what are people now hoping for? <laughs> Would you like to stop it? He, can, he, can, he captured it perfectly. <laughs> I, I'm not sure there's hope. Yeah. <laughs> At least not right now. Yeah, I, 
I second what Mustafa just said. Um, the liberal opposition is kind of just um, disheartened at this point. Um, they, again, we reminisce about the 18 days and, and everything that's happened, but um, I, I, I really don't see any hope at this point. And even among the older generations, my, my family and, and people of their age uh, group um, just want stability. As, as boring as that sounds, and as boring of an answer as that is, it's just kind of the way it is at this point. Yeah, it, it's very unfortunate. No one likes giving this answer, but um, for instance, a lot of the people that I write about in the book who are very involved with, with revolution and resistance in different ways have had to leave the country. Um, you know, they've been faced with this horrible choice of do I submit to the regime or do I try and salvage something of my own individual life for myself before it's too late for me as an individual? And I don't think anyone can blame them for that choice because you get to the point where you think, do I want to you know, persist at any cost? Do I want to martyr myself either literally or figuratively um, for this cause when it's very, very unlikely that it's going to have any actual impact. A question for all of you, but if some of you have more information than the rest, then please speak first. Uh, I'm really curious about the days when the internet went out and um, the um, logistics in terms of organizing, because so much of the organizing that's going on here right now uh, is very dependent on having access to the web and it's it would be really nice to know some tips for in case that should disappear <laughs> thank you <laughs> angie what did you observe I, uh, so the period of time where the internet and um cell phones coverage was cut off i was mostly outside of the country but um I mean, everyone knew the location, right? To Hayer Square, you go there, you get there, you just stay there. Um, so um, at that point in time, it wasn't even a, hey, it's an event at five o'clock, be there, and it ends at nine. It was, we're camping out on the site, no one's leaving, and um, so it was just kind of a, hey, I'm on my way to Tahrir uh, and going there, but um, didn't really require any more organization on that end just because it was in a central location and the rest was actually mostly word of mouth. Um, they didn't have to, they kind of had to not rely on social media or texting anymore. Yeah, it was, it was weirdly ineffective actually and I, I think it says more about the mindset of the regime than anything else because they thought, hey, there's this thing called social media that's a problem, what do we do about it? Just pull the plug out. Um, and it didn't stop people. So in a way, although a horrific thing to happen, it was, it was useful in showing that that is ineffective and you can't sustain it. In, in the 21st century, like, well, you can't cut off a country from the internet. In, in fact, I have a friend, uh, Walid al Hamamzi, who works at uh, AUC and uh, at Cairo University. He wrote a, he's written a paper about this and where he's charted the, the uh, or he had statistics to, to back it up, and it was that the number of people who are out on the streets um, went way up when they cut the internet off because everybody wanted to find out what was going on. So they, they left their, their couches, right, and they went out to the street. So it was completely, from, from his uh, point of view, it was completely ineffectual. And then when they turned the internet back on, everybody went back on Twitter. Like the, the number of Twitter users and Facebook users went, also went way up. So it actually mobilized rather than demobilized the population. I wonder if that's something that's particular to Egypt, though, because I remember in, in um, the early days of the Syrian uh, revolution, they, they, it was actually pretty effective shutting off the internet. And then um, people would just be sort of rounded up and imprisoned, and there was no news about what happened to them. It was, it was actually terrifying. It was people... I, I'm wondering if there's something very particularly sort of irrepressible about Egyptians, or that just being on, uh, with the willingness to be on the street, or maybe it's something about the sheer population, like the pressure of this enormous population. I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, don't I mean, I think the nature of Egyptian society yeah. political, politically is very different than Syria. Yeah. And I think Syrian is much more brittle and autocratic yeah. than yeah. it has been for generations. And Egyptians... Maybe I'm e it's, it's more Egyptian is more elastic and there's been, always been ways in which the regime allows a certain amount of criticism mm -hmm. and then would crack down sort of capriciously. And so, so there's, there's, I think there's a big difference to be had there. 
can I just add that uh, the deep state in Syria is far deeper than Egypt's ever was. So um, if we have one in every three individuals part of a se security service for Mubarak, I think Syria is one um, is, oh, I'm sorry, Egypt's one in every, uh, one every six or seven individuals are part of the security services in Syria. It's like one in every three or something. So it's, it's a, it was a lot more tight hold there. And I think the internet, they didn't have the internet until Bashar slowly kind of introduced it. Yeah, and, and even then it was not as much as, as Egypt. But I, I do think that there's something still about the sort of inter-elite competition element of the early days in the revolution too. So there, was, there were like different groups sort of jockeying for power even in those early days too. So the regime is not as unified as we always think either. Uh. Um, can, I, can I bring this back a little bit uh, also to the U.S.? I, I think it's really interesting that here's storytelling about millennials who took revolution in their hands, I mean, in part, right? But the sto this, these stories are about young people and uh, how much the Internet played a role in general in the Arab Spring. And then we've got a, many, many elections in the U.S. where young people don't really come out. So I was kind of curious from Sana's perspective who... Um, it's certainly in the, me in, the, in the world of the media that speaks to well, maybe much younger people, but it's still reaching younger people. And um, where there might be cross lessons learned, or what are the differences um, from, from what, what Rachel's uh, uh, written about? Well, I mean, I mean, I think that there's an incredible opportunity happening right now with the next generation, with millennials in particular. Um, you know, we are obviously very lucky to be in this country and to have um, a lot of pluralistic points of view and stories out there. And I think that's how people get to know one another. Um, and if anything, I think uh, the most important thing, I think the challenge that we have is reminding the next generation that they are valid and that they are powerful. Um, the way that I'm trying to do it is, in, you know, by very simple stories of superheroes and making sure our superheroes are uh, Muslim and gay and uh, black and of all different backgrounds because that's the only way that you can spread that message in a very obvious way, reminding people that no matter what they look like, they have something within themselves. Um, and I think we have to, one, empower them and then two, find a way to continue to activate them so that they are ultimately unifiers because the divide that has that we have right now is created by former generations and our goal now for our next generation i'm, th I'm talking about my nieces and my nephews um their their intention needs to be to find a way to remember that common cause like rachel was, sh was saying um and bring these people together and um, I think that's a, a much bigger challenge than, you know, we, we, we've left them a bit, a bit of a mess, and we have to find a way to um, in, encourage them. And um, you know, I, I do believe that it's there, and the, the writings are on the wall. Um, but I do get really scared because of the language and the rhetoric that is out there that they might feel disenchanted. Um, so how are we c continuing to build those? You know, you know, give them the blocks for them to do it uh, and, and build a much stronger future. And you know, I'll, I'll do it on my end, and folks are doing it on the other end through journalists, through um, proper education. Um, uh, but you know, I'll always say through arts, arts and culture. I think that's a, an incredibly important part of that. And I, I just add to that. I completely agree with all of that, and I just say that. Um, that doesn't mean ideological uniformity at all. Absolutely. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, it's much better if it doesn't. And I was, yeah, constantly surprised by, by um, you know, I, I describe, for instance, working with um, a conservative Islamic preacher who is teaching young people about um, counter-radicalization and I think this is fantastic work. But when I sit with him and I listen to his teachings about women and about social mores, I'm horrified and I can barely stay in the same room. But, you know, if you want to be pragmatic and get stuff done in this area, maybe you are going to have to find common cause with people who you don't always see eye to eye with on, on every subject. Yes. 
so we've talked a lot about um, Egypt being, um, at least in the short term, a failed uprising. Um, I'm kind of curious, um, <laughs> yeah, fa failed. I honestly agree that it is incomplete. I think the arc of history would, would suggest that, you know, it takes much more time to see if anything failed or succeeded. But in the short term, I would say, um, I'm curious to know what would make a successful uprising whether or not it is um, a cultural uprising that's led by cultural institutions and then have a political uprising to follow. I kind of wonder, you know, what lessons can we take from this and apply it to what's happening domestically? Tough question. <laughs> um, um, I'm gonna tag team with more stuff on this, <laughs> but, um, this may sound simple, but I, I think it, it, it's very complex. Um, so if I got your question correct, right, it's what would, what would it take for it to become a success or become complete, per se? Um, I think it would be, uh, for me personally, someone who is not a strong, a strong man in uniform who comes from the military, who is traditionally what Egypt has seen in the past since the 1950s. Um, institutions that are actually, uh, you know, um, delivering and performing their functions as institutions. So um, you get you try to get anything done. Um, bureaucracy bogs down Egypt. Um, you try to get anything done, it takes. It, you're never going to get something done in one day. Um, corruption has to. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to completely eradicate corruption within Egypt. It's so ingrained in everyone's in in their roots there. But to to to. There's so many things I don't know. I don't know what. There's so many things for it to become a success or for it to come complete. I don't think it can ever become 100% complete. But take the the steps towards that. Um, we're just kind of moving backwards right now. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, well, <clears throat> I think one of the other besides the level of cor levels of corruption, which are enormous, um, I, we ha we ha I don't think we've touched on a media culture. And that's a huge question in Egypt, something that Rachel writes about in her really terrific book, yeah. by the way, which you should all buy, which is available for purchase. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, um, in Egypt, you know, we have seen uh, basically very clearly the ways in which one party state can dominate the media towards driving a population close, if not right, into fascism. And I think that we should be paying attention here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and part of that, frankly, is actually an assault on the arts. And that's happened in Egypt. I mean, Townhouse Gallery, I think, is still closed, right, in, in Egypt. Yeah. And so you have these, these, li these open, creative spaces in Egypt that were very much about sort of trying to keep open civil society that the government is sort of arbitrarily and and forcefully closing down often with under the most absurd pretexts like uh like um some of them are things like the uh well you have um uh, on your computers your version of microsoft word is not paid for oh my gosh yeah you nobody them. yeah that would that nobody would shut down pretty much all of the united <laughs> states as well i think right and so things like that but uh, so I, I really think that uh, you, have, you know the ways in which in Egypt, I mean, uh, Rachel, maybe you can talk about media culture in Egypt too, uh, because there's like there are these horrific television shows that started to come on with the regime too. That way, they were actually um, spying on the whole population, and now the the, uh, the they would just play the phone calls of of people on the television, and uh, and and out them, and and it's like it's just un unbelievable. It, it's cr there's crazy stuff. So um, I'm sure you all read about the case of the Al Jazeera three. These journalists who were seized from their hotel room at the Marriott and detained. Um, and the footage of their arrest was broadcast on state TV with, because obviously the people who were watching weren't going to understand the English that was used. So instead they used the soundtrack from the movie Thor. And it was just this kind of brooding. Oh God, that's illegal. I'm going to have to call my lawyers. <laughs> it's not OK. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's completely out of control. 
Um, and you're quite right that there are, there are many lessons that we must learn from this. I mean, you know, subject very close to my heart. In, uh, in the UK, we have this paper, the Daily Mail, that is completely out of control, was a massive factor in the vote for Brexit. And they have called the judiciary enemies of the people. So exactly the same rhetoric that has been used in Egypt is being used now in the UK and in the US. Yeah, I feel like when you get you start thinking about dictatorships, the first thing that goes is it's media censorship and it's the assault on the arts, like you were saying, because they are so afraid of pluralistic and free thought. And I think that's why those are the two biggest combat forces is, is making sure that everyone has individualistic um, thoughts that are out there. You know, pen is mightier than the sword for a reason. Like, that's how we're going to change minds. Um, but it is, it's scary. That's happening right now, which is shocking to me. Yeah. Well, on that note, I'm afraid I'm getting, um, I'm, I'm getting secret hand and arm signals that it's time to, to call this to a close. But um, I think uh, the panelists will hopefully be able to stay. Rachel's book is being sold um, in the back at the end. She'll, she'll be available to sign books, is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I hope you'll all stay and have a drink and, and chat and, and continue this discussion.